So I have one announcement before I introduce our next speaker. In that break, we conducted some rapid planning. We did a working group to create some efficiencies at the DIMFO social media forum. And I am proud to stand here and tell you that during our question and answer period, once you turn on the microphone, you do not have to turn it off. <laughs> we can keep it on for the remainder of that question and answer period. And then one of us will go and turn it off after. OK, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker who will be speaking about information literacy. And that is Dr. Bob Britton from, du from West Virginia University. Dr. Britton is a teaching associate professor at the Reed College of Media at West Virginia University, focusing on media and information literacy. He has an extensive history in journalism and news design. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bob Britton. Thank you. Oh, do I have a clicker? Oh, it's over there. All right. The physical portion of the book. Um, hello, everyone. Like I'm, as he says, I'm Dr. Bob Britton uh, from West Virginia University. I'm under, I have the understanding there are some pit people in the audience today. Uh, if so, don't worry. I'll speak slowly, so you're, you're fine. <laughs> And if that didn't make sense to you, congratulations, you're experiencing literacy already. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. Good morning. I guess it's still morning. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about, well, as the slide says, we're talking about information literacy today, primarily in the realms of media literacy, uh, data literacy, lots of little flavors within that. Uh, I, am a, I am a journalism and media professor, so that really is my area of expertise. But th th they blur. And, um, and just more broadly, wh when I say literacy, what are we talking about? What's, what's literacy mean? Say what? Words, OK, keep going. What kind of ability is literacy? Yeah, right, right. And, and, and I hear a lot of words. I hear a lot of reading. And that's correct, because we tend to think of being able to read a book. I am literate. And yet there's kinds of literacy. Yeah, understanding, being able to understand what's going on, to read, not just in the literal sense of reading these words right here, but reading a situation, which I'm pretty sure is something you're familiar with, working in defense. And that's a great example, actually, because I, I watched the previous speaker. And as people in the audience introduce themselves to the question, they, they typically identify their position, their rank, where they're from. There's a lot of initial there's a lot of acronyms. I don't know any of them. I do not understand this because this is the, I am a civilian. So I am not literate to what's going on here. I went to the wrong gate three times trying to get on base yesterday. I am not literate for this environment. I am illiterate. And I say that to give you permission to be illiterate or to recognize where you're illiterate. Because media literacy is not about literacy in general. It's not about saying, oh, this is where I'm dumb. No, this is where you are not informed. I'm educated. But I am illiterate with regard to how things work in defense and the military. That is a literacy question. To take it out of that realm, prior to coming in here, I stepped over to the bathroom to do God's work and, um, and wash my hands afterwards. You're familiar with the bathrooms here. I assume they're similar elsewhere. And go to the sink to wash my hands and tap the soap thing and nothing happens. And I hit the soap thing again and nothing happens. And I go to hit it a third time and I think, wait a minute. And I put my hand under the soap thing and soap came out. And that is a form of literacy, too. It's not you know, going to save your life, necessarily. But being aware of what to do in that situation, if you use that bathroom every day, you put your hand underneath the soap thing without thinking about it, because that's how it works. It's you're habituated to that. You understand that's how it works. You are literal, literal, literate with regard to that soap dispenser. A little bit more low stakes. But you're literate with regard to that. I was not, but having experienced other forms of soap dispensers, I was able to figure it out after two false whacks. And this is literacy, too, being that transitive property. If you're literate in one area, being able to cut to the other. Why it's important. Why being able to acknowledge where you are illiterate. Ignorant, which again is not a pejorative. Ignorant is not dumb. It means you need education in an area. Being able to identify where you are illiterate is the first step to improving that literacy. And that's what we're after here. Um, just because you're online a lot does not mean you're social media literate. You might just post a lot. Uh, and you've experienced people. Perhaps you are those people. But uh, this is what we're getting at today. So um, I watched the previous presentation. You all got some great questions. So I might be cutting some things down a little bit, which is better. I'd rather have interplay than not. But let's get started on this. So and let's see if my clicker, I know what I'm doing. Do I? I do. So I'm calling it Spot the Sharks for reasons that you will see soon enough. Good bit of advice. Live every week like it's Shark Week. Who's ever seen this picture before? Who's seen this picture before the last week or so? OK, fewer hands, but still a decent What is this picture? 
It's a shark doing what? Where is this shark, supposedly? Florida. Florida. Other thoughts? In the road? Yeah, on the highway? Puerto Rico? Uh huh. Where, what other contexts have we seen the shark? This shark's an old shark. This shark's been around. Houston? Yeah, he's been, he's been everywhere. He's been in Houston, uh, most recently in California. And this is where our story begins. I like to be topical, which is why I'm always late with my slides, but I like to be as contemporary as possible. Uh, yeah, so August 20th, tropical storm Hillary, which ended up not being as bad as they feared, but hit Southern California. Bad things happened. Uh, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz retweets this image. Now, he didn't retweet the image. He retweets this tweet from Big Cat at Barstool. This is a literacy thing, too, because if some people, as soon as they said Barstool, you said, Pff. or Big Cat, you said, ah because you're literate for what those things might mean. And if not, don't worry, we'll get there. Senator Cruz retweets this with a holy crap, not literally saying, I think this is real, but not saying this is clearly fake. And as so often happens on the internet, eventually, reality intervenes. So here's the original from Big Cat, and we'll get to that. You'll notice that um, on, t I'm just gonna say Twitter, all right, I haven't made the leap yet, and I, I feel like a fool saying X, even though, uh, anyway. And, and, and when I got this screenshot, which was only a day later, there were already context things underneath. I cannot speak, I try to be transparent, I cannot speak to whether that was there, those disclaimers were there that I've outlined and read at the time that Senator Cruz re retweeted it. I don't know this, so I can't speculate. They're there now. It's also on Senator Cruz's retweet as well, indicating that readers added context uh, that they thought people might want to know, things like this, that this image has a, and we're gonna get, come, you're gonna see the shark a lot today. Uh, but this image has some history of being, in fact, not, from what it says, it is, and in fact, not even current. Um, <laughs> Senator Cruz, to his, I guess we'll say credit. Um, I, and I say this coming from a journalistic background. I, I like transparency, so generally, um, you take down things that are harmful, but we don't erase necessarily past records because we leave them as a record that this is where we went wrong and this is how we made good on it. Um, that's not true in all cases, but I like this here, and responded to uh, once he was, you know, identified like this is a joke, this was not real, uh, and said, I'm told this is a joke, in LA you never know. He didn't delete the original, he responded to an update, to which Big Cat responded with another fake shark picture, and there's, there's a lot more. And if you go to his thread, you'll see even more fake shark pictures from hurricanes that in fact were not any of those things. And this is a little object lesson um, that's gonna be a kind of a through line for what we have here. This is a metaphor, but it's also literally true. Always assume, assume the shark picture is fake. Um, I don't know how many shark pictures you encounter in your, in your daily life, but the reason for that is seeing a shark on a highway, why is that, never mind what you may or may not know about this, why is seeing a shark swimming up a highway compelling? Yeah, it's not where you generally see a shark. It's unusual, it requires a lot of Water, it requires a highway to do something that a highway doesn't generally do. It requires sharks, um, you know, it requires a you know, hurricane. You know, there's a lot of unusual things that go together. And as human beings, we like novelty. We like the unusual. We like what, this is a, a broad thing. Your mileage may vary at in the margins, but we, we, we like the, un, um, the unusual. We like the unexpected. We like a story. What a story. And um, as users, whether institutional or individual, which I know the previous speaker addressed that split, which is, as we all know, a lot blurrier than we might want to believe, um, that emotional pull, that desire for something to be a story is a very, very, very human thing. You'll never fully beat that out of yourself. We like a story. A good story is compelling. And there's nothing wrong with that. But this is where the literacy comes in, being able to recognize that tendency. See, we're starting right off with the eat, eat your vegetables part of today, which is the be aware of what your role is in sharing. Because we talk about media literacy here, and we tend to think of media capital M media, this is CNN, Fox News, that kind of thing, and that's media. But so are you, right there in the tin, right? Social media, if you are posting, you are media, you are a medium, you are translating something to a mass audience. Maybe it's a mass audience of 10, but you are putting that out there. You're complicit, you play a role. So this is one of our watchwords going through. Always assume the shark pick is fake and understand that you too are the media. This is where we're going from. Whether it's as a member of defense or whether it's as an individual, if you're amplifying somebody's signal, even if everybody else is doing it, you are part of that. So let's move on from there. And what we're gonna focus on, and bear with me, we're getting into the texty slides here for a second, but is the question of what the senator and you could have done differently, because regardless of your opinions of this or that politician, what Senator Cruz did is a very, very human thing to do. Because this isn't the first time Hurricane Shark's been shared, which some of you are aware of. We will come back to that. Uh, but understanding what you could have done differently and in a more media, media literate way is what's of value to us here. 
And if we get to talk about a shark for a little bit, that's fine too. I could have been more serious. I could have talked about Evgeny Prigozhin, I can't say it. Uh, whether or not he's dead because a plane crashed, was shot down, we don't know. Fully sure yet, we know he was on the passenger list, we don't know if he was there, that kind of thing. And that's a real world serious example from yesterday. And we might strongly suppose that that person is dead, but we don't know for sure. And so how do we handle that situation? We need to talk about what's happening in the world and when news breaks fast and yet we don't have all the facts, how do we cover it? That too is media literacy. But you can apply the hurricane shark principles to that as well. So. What is media literacy? I'm going to start by not answering that question. Uh, the idea, first let's talk about what media literacy does. Media literacy, what it should do. Should help people understand, produce, and negotiate meanings in a cultural made up of powerful images, words, and sounds. I think that covers it, images, words, and sounds. But understand, produce, and negotiate. This is what it should do. It doesn't explain what it is, which doesn't seem helpful, but stay with me. Uh, there's an understanding at the heart of media literacy. And this is, again, where you all are complicit, where we all are complicit. To understand that all media messages are made by someone. Constructed is the fancy verb, but made by someone, made for someone, and that you are one of those someones. Every tweet, X, every Facebook post, every whatever, whatever, that is for somebody other than a person you're talking to is a mediated message. You are making a message, you're someone, I presume, and you're making it for someone. And someone's, in many cases, who are not your intended audience will still read that. That's media, in between, the middle. And so understanding that and understanding it and thinking about what it is we're doing is what we're getting at with media literacy. Not just protecting ourselves, but making. So again, what is it? Okay, fine. Um, and again, I'm happy to provide you citations if that's your jam. Uh, but broadly, the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media in a variety of forms. Um, there's five, four, five, yes. Five core competencies of it, um, and you can figure out what these verbs mean. To access, can you get to the information you need? There's a governmental side to that. What's available to you via Wi-Fi, via news deserts, via things like that? But also, do you know how to find information about what you want? That goes beyond, I Googled it. I have a 13-year-old. Um, she hates this stuff because I'll start telling her why that exciting YouTube video isn't real. She's like, I know, because he doesn't cite sources, blah, blah, blah. It's great. As soon as they're annoyed with you, they've internalized it. Um, being able to analyze the stuff that you've accessed. So it's not just, I trust the Washington Post, which I do. But that doesn't mean I don't analyze what I read. Don't trust anything, including me, which we will get to, blindly. Including anything I've said never always do. There's a hint here if you can catch it. Um, don't trust anything like that blindly. Not don't trust anything. The second part of that matters too. But analyze and evaluate the information you take in, even though it's been from a trusted source. Always analyze, evaluate. These next parts, your previous speaker, and I know speakers yesterday as well, addressed this. We won't talk about it as much, but the ability to create and reflect matters, because that's the personal side. Being able to create, and that's not saying I made a news broadcast. That's saying I put up a post. That's creation. That side of media literacy is one we often forget in favor of the other side, which we will get to. And reflecting on the things you have made. How well did I do? Not, it's out there. I don't have to think about it anymore. That matters. What kind of response did I get? Was it the response I get? If anybody who's on social media has had that moment where you put something up and that one friend likes it and you think, oh God, how did I word that poorly? Because if that guy's liking it, I messed up somewhere. <laughs> Usually they're from high school, you know the person I'm talking about. And that last one, act, which is one that often gets out, left out a lot in classes. We're not talking about act in the same sense as create. Creating is posting, creating media of your own. Acting is what do you do with the knowledge that you now have? Not in your personal life. You've already done that if you've done those four other competencies. Acting is what do I do? That's not saying you become a political activist. But how do you educate others when you've got that uncle that shares the wrong thing? Do you go out and say, actually, this isn't true, and then never end up talking to him again because you hate each other now? Or do you address that in a different way? Um, do you engage that in your life? Do you engage other people with that? And we'll, we'll get to it. There's a lot to cover, and we have only so much time. So. Um, Two spheres, we're getting to the end of the text stuff, don't worry. But two main spheres, I put this up here because it's important. There's two main spheres you'll see in the research of media lit. The protection sphere and the empowerment sphere. Generally, when we think of media literacy, we think of the protection sphere, the keep yourself from getting fooled sphere, and that's important. But if we only think about that, we're not getting the full thing. We're just treating the media as a thing that other people do that we need to be protect ourselves against because they're out to fool us, they're out to trick us. That's a bad way to live. Don't live like that. Skepticism is not fearfulness, it's being aware. Keeping yourself safe, yes, definitely. There are bad actors and there are mistaken actors, which we'll find out more about, um, but that's only part of the thing. If you can't make a message to save your life in the world in which we live, that doesn't mean saying you're putting on a news broadcast or making a newspaper, but if you can't 
make a post on social media thoughtfully, if you can think about what goes into your podcast, then you're not fully media literate. You have to be able to make the things that you do. Not everything. Don't go out and make a movie just because you like movies. But the media texts we make help make us more savvy about taking in media text. This is part of it, too. I'm not saying start posting more, but definitely start posting better, either part of your institution or as an individual. The questions I heard in the previous session about dividing the individual from the group, things like that, this is thoughtful. This is the path that you want to be on. What does it say about me when I share this? It's not saying you can't share that kind of information. It's being aware that when I share X kind of information, I'm presenting this kind of thing for critique. Am I comfortable with that? Did I lose it? No, we're here. OK, good. Uh, that's what we're after. Think about what it is we do and how we do it, and can we do it better? Not self-censorship. Being aware of when I put information out there, as is my right, I realize there's occupational restrictions. Um, Am I comfortable with the consequences? Am I comfortable with what the repercussions of that information are? That's literacy. Neither being fearful nor making stuff makes you fully literate. It's the two parts how they work together, which is what, as I've seen from the schedule, this conference is about. And so let's talk about, as we move back into examples, what we're talking about when we talk, I'll focus a little bit more on that protectionist side right here. Um, when we talk about misinformation versus disinformation, uh, the idea of what the difference is. There's two main things you're dealing with when you're protecting yourself from bad actors, misinformation and disinformation. And when we think about, from a protectionist standpoint, we tend to think about disinformation. The people that are out there to fool you, the internet research people in Russia, you know, the people that are making up false accounts and bots and all those goblins, they're out there to trick you. And they're out there, they exist, they are bad, don't, yes, full stop. But far more of the bad information we take in is misinformation often well-intentioned, often coming out of ignorance, not stupidity, let's keep that distinction clear, but ignorance, false or inaccurate information because somebody got the facts wrong, somebody didn't vet their sources, things like that. Disinformation is information that's out to trick you. And that's a distinction. And I'm gonna show you some examples of why the first one is more common and I argue probably more dangerous. Good rule of thumb, once again, I gotta keep beating this drum. We always assume that shark pick is fake. You know, it's worded a little bit differently than how I said it before, but always assume the shark picture is fake. Not literal shark pictures, but literal shark pictures also. Here's a shark picture shared by a disinform disinformer that wants to fool people. Here's a shark picture shared by someone who thinks there's a shark swimming up the highway and wants to let other people know. Are there any differences between those two pictures? There are not. It's the same picture. That information does the same damage regardless of what the intent was. So we sometimes lose so much time quibbling over like why people did this that we don't think about the fact that either way the bad information's out there. Being literate, using literate practices in your consumption and your production helps keep the bad information from being out there. Regardless of what the disinformers are doing, it's the misinformers that we can have some effect on because we are they. Everybody in this room has shared something false, unintentionally. I am confident in that statement. I have shared my false celebrity death or two in the past. Um, John Goodman has died many times, not always on my watch, but I've seen, I've seen several John Goodman deaths making the rounds. Uh, maybe you've put up that thing that says, if you post this, Facebook can't use your pictures. You know, it's, this information's convincing. Somebody made that with the attempt to deceive. You probably didn't share it with the intent to deceive. Misinformation is what we can play a role in dealing with, both in terms of what we take in and in terms of what we put out. And this is the culpability side of things. Politifact.com, who's familiar with Politifact? Hands, please. Yeah, a couple, maybe you've seen sites like this. I'm at WVU, we have, in my editing class, we have a partnership with PolitiFact. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning fact checking site. It's one of the best, there's lots of other ones out there. I've got some resources in, in a document that I've, that I've shared um, that we'll make available for some fact checking uh, resources that you can use going forward. Um, they've been a partnership with us since 2016. 2016, by the way, is the year where just about every university started some kind of misinformation literacy, information literacy class. Um, this is when our partnership started. Just that's the year where we got really freaked out by the fake news thing kept coming up, and that's there. But once again, we focus so much on disinformation that I think a lot of organizations didn't focus on the role of misinformation. But we have this partnership. What I'm showing you here is just a sampling of, if you, if you search PolitiFact West Virginia, you'll see all the searches that our students have done. We teach this every fall. They do checks on West Virginia or West Virginia related claims. Um, and students identify these by public officials or in the public interest, they check them out. And PolitiFact issues a ruling that they are right there. They have this cute little meter they do, people like visuals. That ranges from true, uh, mostly true, half true, mostly false, false, and then the coveted pants on fire, which is just a whopper, just 
outrageous stuff. I'm happy to share some pants on fires with you. They're, they're, they're a hoot, um, but we'll get back to that. Um, this is one that I plucked out. This is one of ours, and I thought you guys would enjoy it because you're involved. It's, it's, it's defense. Um, the, the question, and PolitiFact is a formula. They always write their headers like this. Did a truck carrying Moderna vaccine crash, and did the Pentagon handle the recovery? Here's a claim from a local podcaster, Tim, well, regional podcaster, Tim Poole. Um, he tends to lean left, but he is, he's an he's a established regional podcaster with an interest in, in the well-being of the area. Something bad just went down near Morgantown. A Moderna shipment truck crashed, hazmat dispatched, airspace shut down, and now apparently emergency response is claiming the Department of Defense took it over. My God. What a crash. Uh, and this is from, again, this is from 2021, so two years back now, almost exactly. Um, and so how PolitiFact does the article, they give the headline, and then they ask, they restate things a lot because they recognize that audiences tend to read a headline only or a headline and a lead only. So they make sure you're getting the information you need as early as possible. And they rule this is half true. Now they have reasons for why things get broken out the way they do. Uh, and here's why, basically, yes, hazmat truck did crash. It was a Moderna shipment. Uh, it did spill on the Cheat Lake Bridge, emergency response, that's the claim. Um, yes, these things happen, a local hazmat clue, uh, crew was called, but airspace was not shut down, defense was never called in, that part's not true, it's all local. And so they said it's half true. And this is a discussion we have, was like, why is this half true instead of false? Well, because at the core of it, the thing they claim happened, happened. The other things are fake. Now, I can't know, and he hasn't gone on the record as saying uh, what the intentions of Tim Poole were. And that's not the point of what we're after. You can't know that. You are not a mind reader. But what I see happening here is a desire for that compelling story. Because again, I want to stress that hazmat truck, that truck crashed, Moderna spilled, all that's true. And that's a big story. Shut down Cheat Lake Bridge. It's the only way to get across Cheat Lake. And yet that's not enough of a story for us often. And so if you caught that rumor, I'm going to go on the basis that he didn't make this up right now so we can move through this. But that's not enough. So I saw some guys in uniforms there cleaning up. I bet those guys from defense. And that went from, I bet they were, to those guys were from defense. Because that's a better story, isn't it? Uh, that the government came in. That a big thing happened. Maybe there's a cover-up involved. Maybe I saw a helicopter going to the hospital, and maybe that was a government helicopter. And that story builds. And again, I cannot know the heart or the mind of the people involved, but I can say with regard to human, let, if we make even the assumption that nobody was deliberately trying to disinform here, it doesn't change the fact that misinformation got out in the world. If we spend so much time on the intent side of things, trying to prosecute, we're missing the point of the work we could be doing right now, which to get at the fact that what happened and what didn't happen, not what were their intents. I'm not saying don't concern yourself with that at all, but this is something we can do right now. Find out what actually did happen and get that on the record and get that out there clearly. Um, our intention to look for whoppers is, can take us in the wrong path too. This is, and this is just on the West Virginia page. But if you go to any PolitiFact page, and they have subpages for different states and different subjects, um, they do a breakdown of how many checks have come through in area. In the years we've been doing this, we've only had two pants, pants on fire results. Two absolute flaming lies. One was a guy who just made his own internet video and shared it widely spread, which is why we picked it up, that he claimed that a hotel down in Charleston was going to be shut down and turned into a mosque and he had all this information. We literally talked to the neighbor who was a city controller, because it was a small area, and he said, no, this is what's happening, and I don't know what that guy's doing. He showed up and just started making up stuff. And it was so preposterous we went with that. And that's the kind of thing we tend to talk about, but look at those percents. The vast majority of the claim, almost two-thirds, not quite, was either true or mostly true. And in fact, most claims are mostly true because, you know, public officials will tell the truth, but will add that little skosh of exaggeration to it. Uh, only 1.6% pants on fire. Only 24% had any level of falsity to them. A half-truth might be just incomplete. And you saw that half-truth there where there was false details, but the fundamental uh, claim being made was true and then just embellished upon. But the heart of the claim was about that spill, which was true. Um, once again, I keep hammering this point, but that's, that's what we're after here, is worrying about the bad people, worrying about the bad actors. Certainly, that's important. But if we focus on that so much, we're catching 1.6% of things rather than that vast, much larger uh, majority that comes from people sharing information, often good intentionally, um, often in a human way because it's a good story, and not thinking about where that information came from. 
And that does a lot more damage to those little insidious truths that come from your mom, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your, your dad, that, well, it might as well be true. And these are people that aren't trying to misinform, and yet nonetheless are. This is where the work of misinformation tends to come out. It's not a vast conspiracy. It's humans being human. And it's a lot harder to break that because if it's one bad person, you can catch that person. But if it's Aunt Hilda, you know. And that half-truth matters because there's truth in that original. There was a spill. You might look at that and say, that ah, feels mostly false to me because the uh, defense wasn't involved with it. But in fact, has a set of standards for how they do it. Other sites have slightly different standards. They explain them really clearly. Showing your work, by the way, that's another thing we're going to go to. If I know how you found your information, that's a lot better than if you just tell me it's true. Um, he's a local podcaster. Again, we would call this misinformation. He claims, perhaps irresponsibly, but claims to have heard this. If we take that on faith, which I realize there's potentially issues with that, then that's misinformation. That's not somebody out to fool you. Um, and when news is hot, like with the Evgeny Prigozhin story, there's a desire to want to cover it. There's a desire to believe it's bigger than it is. And that's not just the news organizations. That you, that's you and me seeing that story and saying, I got to share this. This guy died. I got to share that story. When Kobe Bryant died in 2020, remember 2020 before COVID? You know, like things happened before COVID. It's hard to remember that. And when Kobe Bryant died in the beginning of the year, um, the original story that went around through reputable news sources was that all four of his daughters were on the helicopter with him. And it turned out to be just one of them. Nobody was intending to lie there. Those all came from sources that would be reliable sources. But the sources those news stories got it from were wrong, which is what happens. It's called provisional truth. It doesn't mean they're OK and they're off the hook for it. Uh, people got suspended for that, fired in some cases. But nobody was trying to deceive there. And I don't say this to treat the world naively and blindly trusting, but understand that most of the problem we deal with with information comes from misinformation. And that's you and me. That's sharing what we didn't check out or sharing what we kind of want to be true. And I want to get to that. So let's talk about those persuasive appeals. This is where things come from. We're going to go back to the Greeks. Don't worry, not too many statues involved here. Uh, I'm going to go way back to Aristotle to understand these appeals. It still holds. And I want to show you examples of what we're talking about. So Aristotle, way back centuries ago, laid out that there's three main routes to persuasion. And they hold pretty well today. Ethos, pathos, logos, don't worry if you don't speak Greek. I don't. But the idea of what are you appealing to to persuade someone? And there's three routes you'll see. And the thing is, these are standard. You can think most persuasion, or persuasive arguments you'll make today use the same three routes. Um, and the other thing is, because these are signs of persuasion, any one of them can be used to lie. I'm not saying don't trust any of these. But understand that if I can use something to tell the truth, if something means true, then something means a lie. If you've ever seen a Star Wars movie, put on the Stormtrooper uniform, and now people just stop paying attention to you because you're using the sign, I'm with the Empire, to sneak into the Death Star or whatever. That's how a sign can be used to lie. If something's a sign, something can be used to lie. So let's talk about this. Ethos is source credibility. The person saying it is credible, which is why there were so many ads way back in the 50s and 60s for your doctor says smoke up because doctors are trustworthy when it comes to health. Dentists apparently say, yeah, great for your teeth. Um, it's not even a real dentist. It's just a picture of a guy. To the 90s, and again, I think we've got a room that'll probably, that's still, Michael Jordan's still a cultural touch point. I think we can still go with that. Michael Jordan sold underwear, batteries, things like that. I'm sure Michael Jordan wore underwear and used batteries. I don't know if him being an amazing basketball player necessarily makes him credible, but this is an ethos appeal. Sometimes it's, this person knows about health, so you should trust them on health matters. And sometimes it's, you know this person, so buy this whiskey they like. Uh, these are ethos appeals. They're based on where it's coming from. Case in point, here's me. That's my credential, PhD, University of Missouri. That means I get to put doctor in front of my name. I don't, it feels weird, but I, I can. Um, and my, my scout troop, they, they like to, because they're proud, which is nice, but they, they like to, this is Dr. Britton, and I hate that, because people are like, what kind of doctor are you? And I like social sciences. Um, <laughs> It doesn't mean you want me operating on you. That is literally, factually, that is true. I am a doctor, but you don't, I know first aid because I'm an Eagle Scout, but yeah, I know. Um, and so, and that matters because sometimes we use those ethos appeals in a slippery way. So, for example, even the residents of Shanksville have not been, um, I, uh, my doctoral dissertation was on memorialization and, and media images in 9-11, in, um, particularly focused on the Flight 93 memorial. 
if you've never been to Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, you'll never experience it, if you, if you haven't gone yet, you'll never experience the way it originally was, which is that locals came together and built up on a fence because there, no, there was not allowed to be an official monument there. It was privately owned land. It was a, a gas company, I believe, owned it. And so local historians built up a wall, uh, uh, like a chain link wall. People started leaving there. It's a, it was amazing. Anybody who came just left things. Keychains changed, dolls, whatever they had in their car, people felt compelled to leave something. And it's not quite like that anymore because now there's an official monument there. And I interviewed people and did a lot of research on that and could speak informally about what the memory making process was like in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. This is what I research and it's verifiable that I'm an expert on this because you can find it. You can check it out. You can see, yep, that's him. That's what he does. You might not agree with me, but yeah, I'm a legit official on that. Based on my observations, the coronavirus is likely to fade away like other epidemics, said Dr. Britton. It's just not something you have to worry about anymore. I am not a virologist. I am not an epidemiologist. Saying Dr. Britton is correct, sure, but I don't do those things. Now the quote doesn't claim I'm a virologist or an epidemiologist, but that doctor's doing some heavy work there. And the creators know what they're doing there. He's an expert, put him in there. That's a bad ethos appeal. This is a, oh, wrong way, sorry. This is a good ethos appeal, because I'm an, presented as an expert in something that I have expertise in. This is a poor ethos appeal, because I'm not. And that could work a lot. We can see Dr. So-and-so said, this expert with this said, why are they credible for it? Aristotle's next appeal, logos, logical argument, facts, figures, data, details. This is a great one to use. You'll see it the least common because there tends to be a lot of words, but the home, something near and dear to my heart that you'll see it most often is in information graphics. You'll see logos-based arguments in graphics all the time. We know that readers tend to trust graphics, maps and charts. Not universally, not blindly, but we often tend to see a graphic or chart similar to photos and think that's probably real and either gloss over it or read it and trust what we're seeing. And so this chart from the Wall Street Journal that shows where Lahaina buildings that were destroyed in the Hawaiian wildfires are is a logo space pill. Here's the data. Here's the facts. And this is true. This is real stuff. Um, this chart from the Washington Post is Department of Data. Who's most likely to smoke weed and is it NPR listeners? That's, that's their headline. Um, and we can see like age groups and, and that kind of thing. And you notice in both these charts, they indicate with notes when it's from, they tell you exactly where it's from. National Survey on Drug Use, pretty reliable source. Um, back here, we've got data that comes from uh, OpenStreetMap, Maxar Technologies, Planet Labs, uh, satellite images, good reliable sources coming from pretty reliable outlets. But the thing about graphics is that we can see these facts and because we tend to, it tends to be a cognitive shortcut to, yeah, that seems trustworthy, those logos appeals can trick us too because, well, it's a chart. Somebody made the chart, clearly it's true. So if we see a correlation between uh, people each year who drowned, fall, drowned by uh, drowning in a pool and number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in, we see they correlate. One goes up when the other goes up, one goes down when the other goes down. You know, on its face, this is what's called a spurious correlation. When two things align, it doesn't mean they go together. One, two things correlating does not mean one caused the other. Classic example is every summer, the rate of ice cream consumption goes up. Every summer, the murder rate goes up. These two things are true. So clearly, eating ice cream leads to murder. <laughs> and we know that's not true in its face. There's a, there's a, there's a, a conflating variable there. What, what's, what's likely causing both those things? Yeah, it's hot. When it's hot, you eat more ice cream. And when it's hot, you get cranky. Like these are, these are both true, but it doesn't mean that because they both go up that I'm not saying there's a third variable that leads to both these things happening. It's a spurious correlation. And yet, seeing that chart is persuasive to some people. Now, I'm presenting preposterous examples, but we often believe it. Um, ESPN loves to do this kind of thing. Sports channels in general love to put up a chart that shows a bar that's this high and a bar that's half as high that says his fastball has really dropped off, but there's only a two-mile-per-hour difference between the two. One is lower than the other one, but it's not half that. But that visual impact's been made because we talk about bias in news all the time. And I'm not saying liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat bias doesn't happen, but the far greater value in news, particularly TV news, is towards contrast. Big differences, things like that. There's your conspiracy theory for the day. And sometimes, we're not, we, we are not even trained to look at the things we need to look at. Uh, every number in this chart is accurate, or at least accurate based on where it came from. What's problematic about this chart? It's not the numbers. What's the issue? What's the source? And what do we know about De Beers? Yeah, it's the largest or one of the world's largest diamond mines. Do you think they have an interest 
in showing that, oh, people way prefer natural diamonds. Now that said, I want to be clear, what we're talking about are ways to test, to develop your sense of smell. Is De Beers an accurate source of information about diamond mining? It sure is. This is what they do. But this isn't about diamond mining. This is about people's perception. Now, now self-reported opinion data is always a little bit dodgy to begin with. But particularly here, it's not that De Beers doesn't know diamonds. It's that they may have a vested interest that's problematic in seeing that, oh, people definitely prefer natural diamonds. I mean, clearly. Maybe you want to find a different source to do that survey. Um, things are getting spicy now. This is from a study a little while, or not a study, a, a story that BuzzFeed did in conjunction with Pornhub, the largest distributor, of, or largest website for pornography in the United States. There, you can look up this story. It's a long thing. And it got put out, and it was very, it was, it was very popular um, for reasons. And that what they looked at is pornography based on where people logged into Pornhub from, IP addresses, um, and how they voted uh, either red or blue in the 2012 presidential election. You can quibble with that, but it's a, it's a decent proxy. Uh, what's a, what, are, what are some compelling takeaways from these charts? Kansas, right? Look at Kansas. I mean, if you've been to Kansas, maybe you're from Kansas. I went to Missouri, so I won't be too biased about that. But like, yeah, I mean, I guess you know, once the corn's in, what else are you going to do? But, um, <laughs> But like, yeah, it's that big jump for Kansas. Now, overall, blue states uh, had, had the overall higher average, 137 versus 121. But yeah, Kansas, holy crap. Um, any guesses to why that is, other than Kansans be watching porn? Well, it's a decent size, actually. And I, I, I should have brought the numbers. That's, that's a good guess, possibly. Maybe overrepresented in Kansas. It's actually not the case here. And, and I am so, there's another site, which I can share the link to, that broke down. There's a lot that's wrong with this story. But it's a great story because, man, seeing Republican and Democrat consumption of porn, that's a fun story. That's a what a story kind of thing. There's got that prurian edge to it. You know, um, here's the thing. When data isn't geocoded, such as when you might be using an anonymous browser, you know, like when you go to a pornography site, not that anybody in this room, but you, you get what I'm saying, um, it codes to the geographic center of the United States, which is Kansas. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, but what a story. Not that we pick on Kansas, but if any one state, if any one state was at the top of the list, it'd still be compelling, like, man, Utah? Or Nevada? Oh, of course, Nevada. Or whatever. If it was any one thing, we love outliers. Uh, this one thing's different than everything else. Man, what's up with Delaware or whatever? Um, and that's a problem because we're getting into that third area, which we've already talked about with the shark pictures, which is pathos. These are your emotional appeals. Pathos is when I shock you into buying a Whopper or to changing your behavior. Pathos is when Sarah McLaughlin comes on and plays in the arms of an angel and shows you shelter dogs and you go out and adopt 20 of them because that's a heartbreaking commercial. Some of you, that's a cultural touchstone that's passed you, but the rest, if you know, you know. That's, I'm not, I won't show that to you because I don't want people in tears. Um, pathos is hit me in the emotions, and it's not good or bad, but pathos is about making you want to believe, making you, the old Stephen Colbert thing, not knowing in your head, feeling the truth right here. And the pathos appeal is responsible for, here's a made-up statistic, 99% of shared misinformation because we want it to be true. We stop thinking when we start feeling. That's not a, a, a slam on the heart. Um, but wanting it to be true is where we get in that trouble. We're feeling instead of thinking. Case in point, Hurricane Shark lives in pathos because I want the amazing story to be true. Having defense involved with the Morgantown chemical spill makes it a better story. I want it to be a better story. I want the world to be interesting. Even if it's bad interesting, we want the story to be good. Pathos is where the feels are. And so to deal with these things, we start thinking about how to start building our toolbox. When we recognize these appeals out here, this is literacy. Figuring out what to do in personal practice, both what we take in and what we put out, is how we improve that. So, got a whole list here. It's in the handout that I'll provide. Just an idea of like tools that I use a lot, both as a creator but being able to recognize that pathos pull that, man, I really want to share this, is the absolute, absolute best sign you can get that you need to put the brakes on. If you want to share it, stop. Even if it turns out to be true, just stop. Nobody's going to suffer for you taking 10 minutes, five minutes to check the thing out. Um, none of these are perfect, but they are tools. And there are tools you could probably think of that you could add to the list. 
One of the best tools you can use, About Us pages and profiles, depending on where you're at. Finding an About Us page on a news site is the most annoying process in the world. They're never in the same place. They're usually in similar places. Usually, any reputable information site should have an About Us page. Usually, you can scroll to the bottom. Sometimes, you find it at the top. It's always a pain, though. I hate that about it, um, but it always is. Social media, profile pages. Click the profile page. Unless you know who that is and you know what you're dealing with, click. Just click. You're online. It's not hard. Just click. You don't have somewhere to be. And if you do, don't be posting. Why are you posting? Get to the place you got to go to. Is there a profile page? Is there a name attached? Can you contact them? Right, it's a little different on social, but you gotta, who does it say pays the bills for a site? Washington Post. You got to scroll all the way down to the bottom. It's dumb. And you got to click on About the Post. And then you got to click on Leadership of the Washington Post Newsroom because there's a separate page for opinion, leadership, and a separate page for like the publishers and the management there. But you can get there and you can see every editor involved in the publication. And you could contact them. It's right there. You know these are real people. Doesn't mean that everything they say is real or everything they say is perfect. But that's a great sign that they're standing by their work. And you could contact them if you needed to. Our student newspaper at WVU. For theirs, you got to click at the top and click on About Us. Then you have to click on Editorial Staff. It's dumb design. You actually don't have to click the second one. You could just scroll and scroll and scroll to the bottom of the page. You're not going to do that. So click on there. And it tells you who's running the DA this semester. Um, if you can find that, it's a good sign. A site like The Onion, if we're familiar with The Onion, or parody sites in general. Might seem like, well, that's misinformation. They're trying to deceive. No, it's not. Any more than Saturday Night Live is trying to deceive when they have somebody dress up like the president. Because if you go to their About Us page, they say, we're a satire site. These are all made up stories. And they indicate they're satire. In fact, on their Q&A, one of the things they say is, what if I want to sue the onion? Please do not do this. We are a satire site. We use invented names except in case where public figures are being satirized. They are very clear this is not real. There's no intent. I talked about it being hard to identify intent. Good parody site makes it very easy. This is parody. That said, you can't control what people do with it. Uh, way back in two, the early 2000s, China saw a story about Congress threatening to leave D.C. unless they build a, a, a retractable dome on the Capitol building. This is, this is the onion. And a Chinese newspaper, a state newspaper, picked up on it and ran it as an example of American decadence. So, you know, can't control people. Can only control yourself. Social media profiles, same thing. Just click the profile. If you've never heard of this person before, click the profile. What are you doing? Click the profile. What is their image? If it's blank, doesn't mean they're fake. My dad's been on Twitter for years, and he has never changed his profile image. It's just the, the blank default thing. Um, when did they create it? If they created it right before they posted, that's a bad sign. If they don't post very often, or if they used to post about cats, and all of a sudden they started posting about politics, something probably, and they might have gone through an awakening, but probably something changed. What do they post about? Going back to our shark example. If Ted Cruz has clicked on Big I assume he followed him. How else would he have seen it? But he ought to know who Big Cat is. He's a humor. I mean, he covers actual sports, but also writes a lot of jokes on Barstool Sports. You can see he regularly posts jokes and satire. That's probably a warning sign. Responses to him. We're clearly in on the joke. These are responses to Big Cat. Like, it's not hard. Uh, to have just taken a second and looked. And this is not, again, a slam on Senator Cruz, because we've all done this. I'm too busy to look for something for five seconds. This is on us. You are culpable in what you share. You are part of the media. Um, just check. Who are they? When did they create the account? What did they share? Like I said, what can you tell? When was it created? What do they post about? If it's only political, some places only post about political, but if you're not sure, that can be a red, red flag because most of us post about little annoyances and victories and stuff in our life. Not everybody, as you've discussed in the previous session. Sometimes we keep that very, very separate. But spelling and grammar, I know that seems weird because we all stumble over stuff, but there's a certain way of misspelling and misgrammatizing, that's a word, sure, uh, things that is often the hallmark of the scammer of the false account. And my favorite, which I'll show you in a second, could you image search the profile picture? Because fake accounts often grab their picture off clip art sites, and they're usually not hard. How do I do that, you ask? Oh, wait, not yet. I've gotten ahead of myself. Quick review for you all. So here's one. You might have met Chloe before. Um, she's been in the news. Uh, Chloe Evans. There's her account. Again, this is from a while back, so this doesn't look like this anymore. These are some of her posts. It was responsible. Obama, this is all going to hell. Dead horse. 
Bravery is the capacity to behave proud. General Ozai's quotes, I used to be a model. Don't ask the meaning of life is. You define it. Quote, true. Maturity is bitter disappointment. Blah, 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 blah. Um, this is a troll. This is an online troll from Russia's uh, internet research agency. This goes back to 2016. But there were tons, tons of trolls like this for a while. They're adapting, but you'll see the same kind of thing. They love to use images of young women. Sexist, but true. Uh, seeing a young woman as the profile account, if you're not sure, can be a red flag. Apologies to young women, but it's just they, they know their audience. Um, other indicators, uh, there tends to be generic things. There tends to be not anything about their life, where they're from. Again, a lot of us po don't post about where we're from. But taken in the aggregate, none of these things are definitely a troll science. But the more things like this you see, the more, pro more problematic things you see, and this is why we developed that toolbox. The more you see, the more those red lights should go up. This is why you take that 30 seconds, I went from five to 30, but to just vet things. If you're not sure, check it out. Talk about how you can check that profile image. Google reverse image search. Y'all are on Google already. Easiest thing to do. Take an image, if it's easier on your desktop or on your laptop, take an image, go to images.google.com. You can click the camera icon or you can just paste the image URL or you can just upload the image, like get a screenshot, put it there. And it'll tell you what turns up. If Ted Cruz had taken the shark picture, he would have, see you paste it right there, or you just drag it right in. It's Google. It's super easy. They're designed to make it easy for you to give them all their information. So they make it easy. If you put that picture in the street shark, you get all kinds of news about it. And this is from a couple years ago that I took the screenshot. But you get it today. You get every time that picture has showed up in the media or elsewhere. It's great. Again, it's Google. They know everything about you. Um, let's at least use it to our advantage occasionally. Um, this is not the first use of that picture, but it's probably the one that really put it on the map. Uh, 2017, Hurricane Harvey. This uh, Scottish guy who claims he's a journalist put this out with a deliberate intention to fool people and said, this is what was happening in Houston during Hurricane Harvey. Um, you'll find, and I'll talk more about it in just a second. I'm not skipping over the rest of the shark, but again, image search is a great tool. There's another one called TinEye that's a little bit more complex, but it's a little more powerful too. Third tool, Snopes and other fact-checking resources. Develop your toolbox like that list I showed you before. Know, have your go-tos. Use them. They won't always give you the right answer, so that's why we have multiple go-tos. Um, when I searched real quick for this, some of the hits right here are from Snopes, which is a great fact-checking site. It's probably already covered it because they are very, Snopes was founded as a debunking site. I know I get people that say, well, Snopes is biased too. Yes, they are biased towards facts. And I say this very confidently because, once again, they show their work. If they say something came from somewhere else, they will provide a link and or a quote to where it came from. They don't just say, this is real, so believe us. That's the point. Anybody that tells you to blindly trust them should not be trusted. If they show their work and you can follow that trail to where it goes, this is a good rule for life, that's a trustworthy site. Um, it's a great go-to resource. It's tagged. If you go through, what they actually break, and this is why I love Snopes, because they always dissect these things. Again, Snopes was a, was a troll way back in the 90s, the guy, and created this site, basically turned white hat, and created this site using the stuff he used to mess with people to catch other people. Where it actually comes from, it goes way back to, like we said, um, somebody had pointed out, it goes back to, I think, 2011. Um, other signs, yeah, I don't, I don't have the whole text here, so I think it goes back to Puerto Rico in 2011. Um, there's the picture. There's where it actually comes from. In a nature magazine, that shark, that's the shark. And it was digitally added to that, hi that flooded highway picture. Check it out. Check the source. Have regular tools that you use so that you know what to do when you're not sure. But not being sure does not mean, well, I guess I'll just go ahead with it. Because again, you are the media. You are a producer. And just the thing, I like, I like Snopes a lot too. This is just a good thing they do. They frequently conclude that did or did not right there in the headline, so you don't have to read the article to find out if it's true or not. You can see, Disney is not ending Disney+. Plus. There's no evidence Ivana Trump was cremated. Uh, they don't always, but often. Biden did not fall asleep while meeting with Maui fire victims. These are all lies. And they put it right in the headline because they recognize that sometimes people just read the headline. They'd love you to click the article, but the information's there. Then when you click the article, you can get the facts that break down why that thing did or did not happen. It's a good site. And there's other good sites, too. Nothing's universal. So what do we do now with this? Quick takeaways again. Emotional appeals, we talked about three different kinds of appeals. Watch for them all. Emotional appeals in particular. The best indicator is if you want to believe something that is the absolute, absolute best sign you can have that you need to slow down and check it out. Always. If you feel yourself wanting to believe that thing about 
this politician, this person, this whatever is true, that's your warning sign right there. Your body's giving it to you saying, hey, look out, that's a flashing red light on the dashboard. I say this to somebody who drove three hours with flashing lights on my dashboard and not doing anything. About it. But generally, check it out. Um, rely on tools and good habits. Get in the habit of clicking the profile if you don't know them. Check the about page. See where it's coming from. Have go-to sites. Doesn't have to be Snopes. There's a lot of them out there. Use them. Check the image. And remember, the shark picture is always fake. That is your guide. Put it on a shirt. Put it on a bumper sticker. That because that thing is always fake, the shark picture is always, always, always fake. Except when it's not, because uh, two years ago, actually, Washington Post, there was a hurricane, Ian, and um, there was video of a guy showing the shark swimming in a golf course because it was that flooded. And this is a, I don't have the video here. That's the clip. You can find it. There's some debate as to whether it was a shark or perhaps a dolphin, but most of the marine biologists who looked at it said, yeah, it's probably a shark. So, you know, there's no absolutes. But even in this case, check it out. Thanks. <laughs> and we got time. Any questions we might have, I'm happy to address. Or if you want to go get barbecue, that's good, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, if people have before we get going. Friendly reminder, you do not have to turn the microphone off after you ask, ask your question. But you do have to turn it on. <laughs> That, that literacy thing of comprehending and understanding. Yes. There we go. Um, keeping theme with Shark Week, uh, Discovery Channel several years ago did the Megalodon special that made everybody think the Megalodon was real. Yes. What's your thoughts on that? It's dumb. <laughs> I could probably say more than that. Yeah, I mean, it's a great example. I mean, it's funny. It's, it's a great one to pick out, but I mean, it's Discovery Channel, History Channel in general. It's like, I mean, ancient aliens. Uh, no, they weren't. Um, and, you know, it's fine, but like, you know, that channel used to be about history. Or like the ghost hunter shows, that sort of thing, which is a collection of idiots in a dark house saying, did you hear that? For an hour. Um, and it's, you know, and, and you know, I'm bird walking away from that, but that's, that's the point is there's that, there's a whole industry built on feeding what you want to believe. That's got nothing to do with politics, but it's coming to that same place. The idea of, of recognizing that, and that's not saying don't enjoy what you enjoy, my wife loves Below Decks. If you've seen any of the news about that recently, it is bad, like some of the stuff. People got kicked off the show for some pretty severe sexual business. And you know, it's not saying, well, don't like that show anymore. And you know, most people, when you watch reality TV, you're aware at some level you're being manipulated. But putting on the clothes, like the Megalodon special, putting on the clothes of nonfiction is, in my opinion, a lot more insidious, even though we're not dealing with hard news, but it's training us to not see, again, I'm not trying to go all tinfoil hat here, but it does train us to see those conventions of nonfiction as being not to be trusted. Being skeptical is good, but it can be a problem because we treat like this kind of thing, and I don't know if anybody really thinks there's a megalodon out there, but the fact that it's packaged as that, as something that's really happening, that, 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 that's not good, and it's, it's, Again, I'm not here to give ethics lessons to the Discovery Channel, because you know, it's, it's, it's an entertainment service. But it's something to keep in mind, because what we take th in through one media does affect how we read the other. It tends to go in that same cognitive basket for us, in that same emotional basket for us. Be aware, that's, I guess that's what I'd say. Be aware of what you're watching. Be aware of when and how you might be being manipulated, and just, you know, it's a tall order. But do try to think about that. And just like, what am I taking as a given? No, there is. I hear it's good barbecue, so. Okay, Dr. Britton, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. As a thank you for your time, uh, Colonel McNorton would like to present to you a certificate of appreciation and a Dimfos coin. Thank you again. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're now gonna head uh, we're now going to head on over to lunch, excuse me. Uh, again, your options are going to be Mission Barbecue is going to set up out here. We're also going to have our unit funds council that will be selling some food, as well as the Cup Cafe. The DFAC, the, uh, the, the chow hall, is still around the corner as it was yesterday, if you have access to that. And then we still have the, the food court down at the exchange. It's about a mile down the road uh, if you're able to drive over there. There's going to be tables in the atrium and then these back rooms that are available for uh, you all to eat in. Also, a reminder that Miss Mel Weatherspoon from our pavilion discussion yesterday is going to be in room 112 from 1230 to 1300 
to talk on some uh, Dinfos mobile training team opportunities if you would like to meet with her. She's currently standing in the back there if you, if you want to quickly grab her and talk about a few things. But uh, other than that, we will begin our next presentation at 1300. Thank you very much, and I'll see you then.